us in worship, inviting us to come to him, to come to his table, to join the feast that he has prepared, to taste and see that God is good. Gathered in worship, we celebrate God's goodness and consider his promises 
In Psalm 34, it says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God's promise, or God promises his very presence when we are at our weakest. And it's no wonder that the writer of Psalm 34 encourages us to pour out our praise and thanks to God in worship. He says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. And then he extends this invitation to the gathered community. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Let us exalt his name together. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my
rest. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence. It's your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. It's your faithfulness. And I will. and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him. 
and of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. Beautiful day. The sun is shining through these amazing windows in this holy place. We have already entered into worship together in powerful and mindful ways. As we were singing that last song, I couldn't help but think about, as the lyrics say, the angels and saints will praise his name. Today, as many of you will know, is All Saints Day. A day that's just not a throwaway day in the church calendar, it actually means something. We think today about all those who have gone before us, faithful witnesses of the gospel of Lord Jesus Christ and his presence on earth, his very hands and feet and voice and presence on earth. We know that two months ago we lost a dear friend at Tyndale University, Doc Knoll. He's one of those saints. But we're so honored this morning to have some special guests with us. We just want to take a moment to, to say welcome to Dr. Melinda Knoll and Doc's sister, Tanya Morgan, and her husband, Chris, who are parents of Christian Morgan. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. We pray that this, these moments together will be refreshing to you and a moment of healing in your journey. Let's take a moment together just for silence of, rec of recollecting our thoughts, of piecing ourselves together through the Spirit before Jesse comes to speak. God, on a day like today where it is absolutely beautiful outside and we are here among sisters and brothers shoulder to shoulder singing our songs out to you, we are so mindful of your faithful presence in our life. And in a world that goes sideways way too often and with much too frequency, we are still aware of your faithful presence in our life. And for those who are mourning in Seoul, South Korea this morning or who continue to protest against totalitarianism in Iran, we know you are with them and that you are with us because you are always faithful present in our life. In God, in mourning and in mental illness and physical ailment and in times of need and times that we just don't feel like singing, you're okay with that. You come alongside of us and you say, I'm here because I am faithfully present to you and to me always. And in those moments where we're just filled with joy and celebration because we know the victory has been won, you are our faithful presence. And now, God, as we think about radical hospitality and what that means for us and for our community and for this place, this place that we dearly love and care about, we pray for Jesse as he comes to bring your word and your message to our hearts so that tear us wide open so we can hear these and that they will mean something to us so that we'll be able to then exit this chapel, this beautiful place, into your beautiful world for the sake of the beautiful work that you are always faithfully present beside us to do. So God, thank you for hearing us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being present already. And by your spirit, we call out to you, knowing that we love you, Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. This morning, Jesse Sodirgo is our speaker. He is a professor, uh, assistant professor of contextual ministry at the seminary. He has a wide variety of, of, of gifts. Uh, I sit on a committee with him, and I'm astounded every time I hear him open his, 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 his mouth because he always brings such 
decisive insight into the issues that we're dealing with. And he's a very visual thinker. He likes to map things out in squares and brackets and triangles that helps all of us understand what he's talking about. He's a gifted communicator, and we're really glad that he's here this morning. Jesse lives in Etobicoke with his wife and his three young children, and we're so glad, Jesse, that you're here. Please welcome. It's an honor to be with you all. Um, just in the worship there, it just felt that word, um, the Lord is faithful, just kind of rang true to me. The Lord is faithful, amen? Amen. amen. It's, um, especially for those who are familiar with pain and, uh, and suffering, for some reason I feel like that's what the Lord wants to say today, uh, the Lord is faithful. Today I'm gonna be reading from the passage in Luke 14, Luke 14, Verse 7 to 14, all right? I'm going to read it for you first, and then we'll get into it. So it says this. It says, When he noticed how the guests picked their place of honor at the table, he told them this parable. So just first, Jesus is there looking and observing some kind of banquet, some kind of wedding. We don't know where it is, but he's seeing and witnessing people coming um, to this place at this table. And it says in verse 8, when someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This passage today that we speak of is a passage about hospitality. It actually is split into two. There's a first part where it gives you instruction on how to be a guest. The the second part is a focus on how to be a a host. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I come into a place, I change based on whether I am a guest or a host. Some people are very shy guests where you offer them, you have to offer them like 10 times if they want a drink or they want something. And some people respond in different ways. In this particular example over here, we see particular instructions on how to be invited into a place, how to be a guest. And the example he gives is quite interesting because it it actually talks about a situation where the guest actually takes the the seat of honor in the place. So there's lots of places that you can sit, but the person who comes, Jesus gives this parable of someone taking the seat of honor at the table. And to me, when we read this passage, it's very indicative of our particular culture today because our particular culture is a culture of self promotion. Right. It's, a, it's a culture where we are always trying to uh, show our best, trying to reveal to people our qualifications, trying to post on Instagram or whatever is the cool social media thing. I don't know. I'm still on social. I'm still on Instagram. Um, but all like we try to show our best to the point that even our good deeds, you know, we see people giving haircuts to the homeless, you know, online or whatever. It's like, it's interesting that everything we do must be presented to the world in a way that everyone knows. Perhaps, perhaps everyone knows that I'm doing something for the Lord or I'm doing something good. And it's in a way, we are in a culture today where we are pushed to self-promote. They say that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, Right? It's that if you're ever in a, in a situation at work, you want to actually promote yourself. You've got to speak up. You've got to be assertive. These are the things that I tell my kids a lot of the times who don't, like, you know, look in the eyes of uh, adults when they're talking. And I try to push them and say, assert yourself. You've got to, no one's going to recognize you, all right? You've got to make sure you rec- be recognized by making sure that you stand out. 
And you know, it's an interesting thing because this was not always the case. There was a time, long time ago, Charles Taylor is a philosopher who indicates this distinction between the medieval period and the modern era. And in the medieval period, just think about it, if you were born into a peasant family, you probably would be a peasant, moving on, right? If you are born in a, uh, in, in a family where you are royalty, then if you're a prince, you're going to be a prince for the rest of your life. And in a way, the status or where you are in society has been dictated for you, right? You have no choice. You can't, you can't climb the corporate ladder when it comes to the medieval period. What you are is what you are. But then... We came to a period of the modern era, the enlightenment came, where we began to think, I say, I think, therefore I am. Meaning, before I am what I am because this is what society tells me, this is what my position in life is. But suddenly we began to start to say, I think, therefore I am. Meaning, if I will it, I can make it happen. And we became, slowly, beings where we can actually be uh, self-defining. Like, I can define who I am. Even though I grew up a peasant, I can be uh, a CEO, I can be a president, I can be whoever I want to be. And in this world that we live in currently right now, where we can self-define, where we can actually find our identity within rather than an identity based on family or tradition or culture, but I can say my identity is based on whatever I want it to be, right? What you end up having is a whole bunch of individualists which, by the way, there's lots of good things that happen as a result of that. But what we, the, the collateral is, is that you have a bunch of individualists trying to define themselves in a particular way and trying to scream it out as loud as they can so that everyone can know who they are. Right? Before, it was a little bit more simple. But now, we try to self-define so much to the point where it's the default to self-promote. It's the default to to find your own way in which you influence the world. And there's a lot of consequences for that. But just just think for a moment, though, when you look at your own life and the the places in which you feel comfortable to not self-promote for a moment. Like, I I usually, it's, it's around friends usually. It's around people I know who already acknowledge my gifts and talents. See, that is the condition. That is the, the, the condition or the environment that allows me to kind of not have to, you know, boast about myself too much. However, if you are in a community or a culture that does not see you, does not identify you, does not recognize you, then what are you going to do? All you're going to do is try to kind of show who you are to them, right? And that's exhausting, by the way. It's an exhausting existence to have to continue to say, this is who I am. And you know what? It's not uncommon for a church or a place of a community like Tyndale or whatnot where we create an environment where it says, if you want to be seen, make sure you speak up. Rather than an environment in which everyone around you seeks to exalt you. Rather than seeking to like a posture of suspicion, right? Like today, you might be looking at me with a little bit of suspicion, and I might be here trying to be recognized for my preaching abilities or whatnot. This is an atmosphere where I can know when I'm in a congregation and they're like clapping for me or they're like, I'm not saying you got to clap for me, but like acknowledge me. There's a certain feeling of welcome, and then there's certain congregations I know when I preach, and there's a sense of like, okay, show, prove it to me. And I automatically respond in kind where I'm like, oh, I'll prove it to you, all right? <laughs> I'm going to bring it today and I'm going to make you all cry and, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to... Like, that's, sometimes there is that attitude that we have and it's in response to the environment that demands self-promotion or it can be an environment that causes you to say, I have no, I have no ambition to have to promote myself because I feel seen. I feel like people are asking me questions and probing deeper and deeper into what I want to, who I am. And that's an amazing, diff- and it's, it's, a, it's very subtle, but it's an extremely different environment to be in. And hospitality has to do with not a, having your guests to have to posture before you in a way. 
Like that's what hos- hos- the baseline of hospitality is allowing people to come into a space where they don't need to prove themselves. Where we do the work actually to ensure that they are seen so that they can let their guard down and not have to come and do that. And so how amazing it would be for us to be in uh, in an environment where someone esteems you before you felt the need to self-promote. How liberating that would be to be seen, heard, and known, to begin to function from a place of abundance rather than scarcity. You know, not grasping for attention, but receiving that gaze of the neighbor, a brother or sister, and disarming you from the need to be seen. In short, the goal is to recognize others before they feel the need to stand out. So this is, the, this is the how to be a guest part of it. The other part of the passage is how to be a host. In this part, he goes, okay, then Jesus says to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends. Or basically, don't invite the people who can pay you back. You know, invite the crippled, invite the homeless, invite the beggar, invite them, because when you invite them, there's no way of reciprocity to occur in, this, in the economic way that you might see it, right? They can't pay you back. They can't invite you back. And that is the way in which to host, the attitude in which to host. Now, this is radical. This is, I didn't mean to say that, but the title is Radical Hospitality Today. But that is radical. Why? Because of the day that we live in today. Like, if you were to apply this in our market-centered Um, quid pro quo, um, cost-benefit analysis, you get what you invest in type of society, then this is ridiculous, right? It doesn't make sense. See, we live in a different economy. The, The kingdom of God is a different economy than the way of the world. The way of the world where we calculate in our mind, and I, you know, we do this all the time, where you're going out to eat, you know, and, and someone Someone treats you out, and then suddenly you feel the necessity to say, ah, no worry, I got you back, bro. You know, I, I got you back, you know. And, and, and we make sure that the next time we eat, it's, it's, it's reciprocal. And I make sure I pay for you, and then next time, make sure you know you're going to pay for me, right? And then we can go back and forth like this. But we need to make sure that they're equal. We got to make sure that both sides are actually doing that. As soon as there's like a discrepancy, it's like... I just don't have the money to go out with you, you know, <laughs> because you're not giving back, you know. And so in that situation, it's difficult. Like, if you see me on Facebook Marketplace, like, I'm, gonna, I'm a capitalist uh, to the max, okay? If you see me on Kijiji, um, working my deals, like, I aim to buy at the lowest price. My desire is for someone to be so ignorant about the value of their product that they will put it up, and I seize the moment right then, and you know, humbly come and try not to give away too much when I do the encounter and run away gleeing with like giggles, you know, like that's my attitude when it comes to Facebook Marketplace. And when I sell, you know, when I sell a product, I do it at unreasonable prices, okay? Um, Hoping, again, that I will dupe someone to come and buy my product at an unreasonable price. That's what I desire, right? But then, and the other day, actually, I, I did this, like, and I, you know, Ikea products are hard to find these days. And um, so I put my, uh, my dresser for uh, on sale, and then someone comes uh, paying, like, a good price for it. And while I'm engaging with them, he tells me, like, he's from Ukraine, and he just came here, you know, like, um, and he just, he's here transitioning with his whole family from a war-torn place. And I was just like... This doesn't work, man. I wish I didn't ask your story because now I'm going to give you this dresser. Everything is, is, uh, is, everything is messed up when you start to see the humanity of the people, right? When you actually hear their story, then I become weak, you know? I become weak and just uh, succumb to generosity, you know what I mean? Like it just doesn't feel good, especially when I want to be on my A game. But see, we need to be Like, how amazing would it be for us to be in a community where we aren't measuring things in that type of way, right? We need a community that conceived of a, what Richard Rohr says, a gift economy that is not based on competition and cost-benefit analysis. The quid pro quo, as I said, not always fair, not always balanced, giving without expecting anything in return, knowing that whether it's 
exact return, the body of Christ always balances things out in ways that we cannot perceive, in ways that we cannot forecast. Imagine, that's the radical side of the generosity where you are the good Samaritan who comes and helps the person on the side of the road, brings them to the inn, and puts down your credit card and says, anything that needs to be done, I got to go. When I come back, whatever it is, not, you know how that, that level of surprise, the level of unpredictability to put down your card, imagine doing this to a homeless person today and saying whatever they order um, from room service, whatever happens, I'll be responsible for it, knowing that there is no cap, you know, that there is no like contract that gives the exactitude of what is going to be given back. This passage is talking to the host, and Jesus points to a fundamental value we have on return of investment, that what we give will somehow get returned to us, that whether consciously or unconsciously, we will receive something. And because today is about hospitality, it is worth noting that hospitality, which is about a host and a stranger, has been commodified, has become something of an industry. Like when you think of hospitality to go to school, if you're going to do a course or get into school somehow, it's about the hospitality industry in which you are the, 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 the person who is hosting and the person is now a consumer. A consumer who is expecting something and rating you a certain way rather than the original form of hospitality, which is a host and a stranger. The difference is, hospitality in its commercial sense is, is related to want rather than need a lot of the time, right? And hospitality to a stranger gives a new dimension. A stranger, in fact, in its truest sense, hospitality has to do with this stranger. Someone who isn't invited, you know? Someone who comes at the door anonymous, unknown a foreigner, unpredictable. And that kind of hospitality is frightening. Like, when's the last time you invited a stranger into your home? Hospitality in our day is someone that we invite, that we measure up to make sure they are qualified to come into our place. We place the conditions. But when we eliminate this ability to be surprised by a stranger, I believe hospitality doesn't come in its truest sense. The kind of hospitality that we must have is a decision to choose trust over suspicion, abundance over scarcity, sacrifice over self-preservation. And I end with this, reminded of how the gospel actually translates this, because the gospel actually, when Jesus is there and the disciples are jockeying for position and they are saying to themselves, like, which of them should be considered the greatest when Jesus is at a very similar table? Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority call themselves benefactors, but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you shall be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I, but I among you are the one who who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you the kingdom just as my father conferred on to me. Host and stranger, and Jesus introduces another term of servant. You know. And the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of God's faithfulness in this whole exchange is that he doesn't even just identify us as a host or a stranger. He brings and introdu introduces the idea of service and the ability to trust like Jesus trusted that although he humbled himself, even though he is like God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, he came down to this world and guess what? The promotion that he gets is not driven by self-determination. The kind of esteem that he gets is not done out of his own pure will and him boasting. Instead, the Christ that we come to is a Christ that comes and is exalted beyond all other things, right? He is exalted among all, uh, exalted to the highest place, it says in Philippians 2, and gave him the name that is above every name. Who does that exalting? It's the Father, right? 
Imagine a community in which the exalting occurs not by yourself, but the one who is our Father. And so with that, let us just pray and have this in our hearts, the attitude of Christ, the amazing gift that he has given to us. And let's bow our heads and pray before the Lord. Father, we stand before you today, Lord, acknowledging how radically different you are from any other person, any other king, any other authority figure in this world. That although you are the one who redeems, you are the one who has the power uh, to heal and do all of these miraculous things, Father, that you are a God who serves. You are a God who did not need to esteem himself, Father, but you are one who is above all names, Lord, as a result of your good work, Lord Jesus, here on earth, Father. We come before you so humbly, Lord God, and we ask God for the faith, Lord, to risk We ask God for the faith, Lord Jesus, to live lives of surprise where we can actually acknowledge, Lord, that something can meet the needs, Lord Jesus, even though uh, we might not have everything in order, Lord God, that we may go out on a limb, Lord Jesus, knowing, Father, that you will complete all things. Yeah, you will bring all things to completion, Lord God. We thank you, Father. You are a good, amazing God, and you introduce things to us, Father, that are so radically different than our current culture today, Father. We esteem you highly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have an opportunity today as a community to participate in the Lord's table, something that we actually don't get to do very often. So I hope that even though we may go a little bit over time, that you'll stay with us to participate in this most radical of feasts, this table that has been set for us by our Father and our King. And unlike what Jesse was talking about just a moment ago with regards to the host and the stranger, you are invited as friends, as brothers, as sisters, as sons and daughters. Brothers and sisters, we are called to a life of radical hospitality. And Jesus, the radical hosts, invites us to his table to be fed by his body, to be fed as his body. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. According to Luke's gospel, when our risen Lord was at the table with his disciples, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Let's pray together. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks for you are good and your love endures forever. We praise you, God, for revealing your love, for sending your only son, Jesus, to live among us, full of grace and truth, sharing our joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and was friend of sinners. Obeying you, he took up his cross and died that we might live. We praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us and believe that when he comes in glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon this bread and this cup, that we and all who share this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. And together as a community, we offer the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, something similar to this. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, 
this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, in remembrance of God's almighty acts in Jesus Christ, we take this bread and we take this cup and we give praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. When we break the bread, it is a sharing in the body of Christ. When we bless the cup, it is a sharing in the blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In a moment, I'd invite you, as you wish, to come forward through the center aisle, pick up a package of the elements. These are self-contained. You can receive one. Go back to your pew along the sides. For those of you in the side aisles, if you'd go to the back of the chapel and come up the, the, uh, the middle aisle, that would be great. So please take one, return to your seat, and then you can open it. You'll see that there's a little wafer on the top and then the juice is below it. Come, all you who are weary and feast on the, at the table. Oh, that he has overcome every trial. 
to the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please receive this charge from Psalm 34 and God's blessing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Hear these good words of benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.